wanted to have it be level, even ground. Louder. So I like to start. Start out. Okay. 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 It's on the ground. <laughs> this way. Yeah. Thank you. It's supposed to be the lesson for everybody in between. Right? Now I welcome you here. I'm Patty Dreyer, Portage County Executive. We are so pleased that you have joined us to hear the voices of Wisconsin elders, people with disabilities, and their advocates as they speak on the governor's proposed biennial budget changes to aging and disability resource centers and long-term care. There has been considerable talk lately, including talk last Friday in this building, which was amazing, about 150 people here, about these proposed changes. So why do it all over again? Why tell the story again today? Sometimes at public hearings and listening sessions, you can't be sure to gather the full story. That's why we're holding a press conference. We wanted to create a video and hold this conference because it would be uh, an opportunity to tell a more comprehensive story, to complement the voices that have already spoken and been heard around the state. We want our state leaders and legislators to make informed and compassionate decisions, but that means they need to have an understanding of what these proposed changes may truly mean to people, to communities, and to local economies. We will give our voices today to three key service areas targeted for massive change. Aging and Disability Resource Centers, abbreviated ADRCs, IRIS, a self-directed long-term care program, and family care. You'll hear more about each of these three target areas through the speakers today. ADRCs, IRIS, and family care are interrelated and function as a whole as a, a whole system, a cost-effective and responsive service system and care for our elderly and citizens with disabilities. Interestingly, these programs are models that are replicated because they appropriately balance quality of care and service with desired fiscal outcomes. Not only do our elderly and people with disabilities benefit through these programs we will highlight, but it's very important to remember that their families also benefit. As a daughter of a mom who was disabled for much of her life, I have lived the sandwich generation story knowing all too well that there is a direct relationship between mom's well-being and my own. When mom was doing well and when we kept crises at bay because we had the proper kinds of supports in place for her at home, then I too was healthier and could stay focused on my job and on my, on my community work. Instead of spending time with mom at a hospital emergency room or looking for the next institution to provide stabilizing care for her until she could come home again. Sound familiar to anybody in the room? Yeah. ABRC's Iris and Family Care are all about daily health and well-being and personal liberty and the importance of access and stability to maximize one's independence. But also, behind these frontline connections, they create and sustain critical local community capacities. They're gateways for local volunteers and businesses to serve people in need. They're gateways for people to live independently longer so they can continue to be engaged with their families and communities longer instead of being marginalized or institutionalized. So we're going to touch on all of these connections through the voices of people today. Let's start with the ADRC, as many people do. This is the bustling gateway to navigating the system and tapping local resources and supports that help prevent and delay people from needing to enter publicly funded long-term care. I'd like to introduce you now to Cindy Petrusky. She's the director of Portage County's Aging and Disability Resource Center located in the city of Stevens Point. It's a lovely place for you today. Center, the home of the Aging and Disability Resource Center of Portage County. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to start by saying that aging and disability resource centers in general, and this one in particular, are successful and cost-effective programs. In Portage County, we are combined ADRC and aging unit, which is part of why we are able to offer the variety of programs that you find here. As a fully integrated model of both aging and ADRC, um, we have a great deal of success. And until the budget was introduced in February, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services was working toward the integration of ADRCs and aging units statewide. That's how good a model it is. There are a number of concerns regarding the budget proposal. The first one is that the removal of the ADRC board statute that would eliminate the requirement that the voices of people ADRC serve throughout the state be included in the oversight of the organizations for providing long-term care. It's that local accountability piece. This is the part where people who are elderly, people who have physical disabilities, and people who have developmental or intellectual disabilities are represented on the ADRC board. And their voices are heard. They are our policy uh, guidelines. They, they do so much for us. And they reflect the people that we serve here in the agency. That would be eliminated in the governor's budget. And of course, um, that is a, a great deal of concern. We also have elected officials on our board who are members of the Portage County Board of Supervisors. Local accountability is means that we strive for quality because we are local. We're not serving some abstract people out in, in the world. We're serving our community. We're serving our neighbors. We're serving our friends. We're serving family. We are serving people we see every day. We run into people in the grocery store. So this is our community. These are the people that, that the ADRC serves. It's community and it's local. Most of the people that we serve, however, are not going into publicly funded long-term care programs, which um, is a very important piece to understand about the ADRC. What we're doing is helping people stay healthy and happy and active in their own homes. We're not putting everyone into publicly funded long-term care. We're helping them stay in their home the way that they want to be in their home. I don't know any senior that if you ask them before they have a health crisis and you ask them what their choice is, you know, where they want to stay, I've yet to hear somebody say, well, I want to go to a nursing home or I want to go to an assisted living. Everyone wants to stay in their home and we help to make that happen. Last year, the information and assistance specialists here at the ADRC served 995 people, so roughly 1,000 people. They had more than 4,200 activities that they performed. Uh, there were 210 long-term care functional screens, and only 133 people enrolled in a publicly funded long-term care program. So 87% of the people that were serving are staying out of publicly funded long-term care, and yet they still need assistance. So it gets to be confusing aging or having a disability because the system, and the system is a different for every person, is hard to navigate. And we help people navigate the system. And it can be as simple as helping someone find a chore provider who will come and clean mom's house every other week to as complicated as applying for social security disability. And that's about as complicated as it gets. Um, it's a very strenuous process if anyone's ever gone through it. So we're helping people stay in their home in the community. When people navigate the system, um, it's hard. We have 
benefit specialists who help them to do that. We have elder benefit specialists who help people who are 60 and older. And then we have disability benefit specialists who help people between the ages of 18 and 59. And so we, they're often referred to as the red team cutters because they can navigate the system and are particularly good at it. Another way that we help people navigate is through the administration of the long-term care functional screen. And that is the gateway to that publicly funded long-term care supports like Family Care and IRIS. Now, according to the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, one of the state agencies, there's no financial benefit to the state to make any changes to the ADRC model. Given that there's no real benefit to the state, you have to stop and look at what does it mean locally. And while it may not make a difference financially to the state, it makes a great deal of difference to us at the local level. So it impacts local citizens, local employers, local small businesses. Um, we have chore providers. We've got more than 50 people on a list who provide um, services to people in the community. They're pre-screened, we do a, a criminal background check, and then we provide those names, and it'll tell people who, who would be willing to do housekeeping down in Alden? Who's willing to do personal cares out in Junction City? So we have this great list that people call here and access, and we give them that list, and they pay for those services independently to help keep them in their own home. There are small adult family homes that would be impacted in our community. There are larger facilities as well that could be impacted by this. Services would be impacted. Um, and in our agency, we have a loan closet. Um, last year, in, 20, in 2014, more than 1,000 Portage County citizens borrowed 1,500 pieces of equipment to help them either recover or they couldn't afford to pay for a piece of equipment and we provided it for them. So that's just the loan closet. With, if funds are cut, we don't have the funding to keep sustaining programs like the loan closet or the chore provider list. We have great services. Our elder benefit specialist last year served 841 people and had an impact of 4 $2 million in Portage County. Our disability benefit specialist served 182 people with a financial impact of $2.5 million. These are not insignificant dollars in Portage County, and those are a lot of people who rely on our services. Medicare Part D season is particularly busy in this building, and as I look out um, in the crowd before us today, I see several familiar faces who have no doubt you know, participated in the services of the elder benefit specialist during that time period. Another point I want to make is that county tax dollars um, would be impacted in, within the ADRC because we would have to reallocate things between our programs. While the ADRC is funded by the state, our federal matching dollars fund other programs in the agency and allow us to free up tax levy in one program and put it in another. Where this becomes particularly um, troublesome is that it makes us feel like we're back in the days where we're going to make seniors choose between food, like the nutrition program, and medication, like the assistance they get from our elder benefit specialist. And that's a walk backwards that nobody really wants to take. So I can tell you lots of wonderful things that we do, but um, instead I'd like to have you hear from a few seniors that we have helped in particular. And the first person I would like to invite up is Lois Hill, who's going to share her story. Actually, Lois, Lois, just if 
it's difficult, you can just sit there and hold the microphone if that's better for you. It is better. Okay.
Paul Paul the beard, yes. And uh, about the options that I had at home, I took care of her for seven and a half years. And uh, I used the facilities here, the daycare center, and uh, the lunchroom, and she was able to come and to get her toenail slip. Other than that, with, with help that I hired, I took care of her at home for that time until she passed away. Uh, October 20th, 14th, uh, if I sign it. It's hard for me to talk about it yet, it's still really peaceful. Bear with me. So this evening is place gold. Well, literally, they're shortening all the people's lives. If they did, we need it. Down the road, I'll probably need it myself. It was here when I needed it for my wife, and, and I thank God for it. And now any of you who want to be a lobbyist with me and, <laughs> and uh, call some of your legislators, I have papers here for anyone who's willing to do it. I've been doing it now for two and a half weeks and getting kind of horse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of them have deaf ears, but let's hope we can <laughs> tune up the irrigates a little bit and get to listen to our pleas for help. So any one of you that are willing to help, and I'm sure you are, I'll be glad to pass one of these among you and start calling. So I guess that's all I have to say right now, but I thank you for listening and coming here today because without this place that most of us are lost. It's a home away from home. For most of us. And it's, just, it's an asset to the state, not a liability. And uh, well, a lot of legislators are treating this as a liability. And not only that, but most of us here are veterans, certainly the World War II or Korean War, which I did. Uh, that would be our age group, the rest of them are probably too young to be senior citizens. Yes. But we laid our life on the line for us the state and our country, and I'll just simply ignore I guess, saying we're a liability and the law are going to afford us. So let's try to change their minds. With your help, I'm sure we can. I, I thank all of you for listening to my story. Thank you. the importance 
of that program for the lung population in Portage County. I would also like to invite Leslie Smith up to talk a little bit about the IRIS program. Leslie has two adult children who are um, in the IRIS program. Unbiased opinion, you get good advice. 
Actually, this time we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, local um, economic impact that the proposed changes might have. And important to these local programs like IRIS and important to living as independently as possible like Mavis and Lois and Donna all do, um, we need to depend on local vendors uh, that provide these services in our community. The ADRC is a one-stop access point for these local connections. ADRCs do background checks on vendors uh, that go on to our short provider list. Um, and then those will provide services, as I mentioned before. But then we also have other local resources, uh, including entrepreneurs, and also volunteers in our community that round out our service continuum and save local tax dollars. At this time, I would like to introduce Tana Rosa, who has a small adult family home in Whiting and um, is a local entrepreneur. Also, a volunteer at the university. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I think everyone knows what an adult family home is, AFH. Does anyone not know what it is? Everyone wants to live in their own home, and I realize that. I want to live in my own home, but sometimes we just don't have a home to live in or a family to take care of us. And that's where I come in. I've been working and own my own four bed facility for 25 years. I take care of handicapped people that have mental challenges. 25 years. Actually, Bob lived with me for 10 years. Bob Perrin here. He first touched the baby's hand when he lived at my home. He had never held the baby's hand before. But what I came here to tell you today is I have an AFH, and in my home, I have four people that live with me. There's always four people. I work hand-in-hand -hand with community care, that's family care, and also the AARDC. Without that, you know, I went to a meeting about, oh, two years ago, and it was called, um, It Takes a Village. And I remember that. You know, sometimes I think I fall asleep in some of these. I get to go to so many, but I remembered that, and it really impacted me today when I was thinking about what I was going to say. My program works best because of the ARDC, because of community care. I have a social worker that works with me, advocates for the people that live in my home, there's guardians. I also have a nurse that comes in and helps me, not in particular with cares, but advice because I take care of people that have really high needs. I also come to the ARDC to volunteer, but also I take away from the ARDC because I have people in my home that come here for support, one person in particular, if the ARDC closes down, this person's lived in my home for five years, I would not be able to meet her needs anymore. She would have to go to a bigger facility where there's staff more, there's more care. When she does that, I will miss her terribly, and I think she will miss us too, but I will not be able to, make, to meet her needs without the help of the daycare program. It provides an outlet for her, and also for me. I'm able to do my shopping, get my house clean. I'm also um, able to transport other people to doctor's appointments. I drop this person off here in the morning, and I know that she is in the best hands that she can be. 
She has a wonderful day. She's doing things that are uh, productive. She's socializing. They're giving her, uh, she's got a lot of high energy, more than I can, can keep up with in a day's time. If this person goes to the next level, if there's no Lincoln Center um, day program, she will have to go into a facility that's going to meet her needs. That's going to cost anywhere from twelve to $2,000 more a month for her to be in a different facility. Because remember, without the day program, she cannot live in my home. It takes a village. Without the loan closet, there's been times that I've called up a doctor where someone's broke their leg or they need a walker, I might need a toilet seat. I run across all kinds of things in my home that I need. And community care is awesome about getting the things that I need, but sometimes we can't get them from Wal Walgreens, uh, medical supply, where, whoever the vendor is. I know that I can call up over here and say, do you have a wheelchair I can borrow? I only need it for a week, or I only need it for two days. And that way I still maintain my household. It's still running. The people in my home are happy. They're well taken care of. I utilize this bus transportation. When someone's sick at my home or having a seizure, and I need transportation for someone, I call. They set up a, a bus transport for the for it to come here to the ARDC for me and to bring the person back again if I'm not able to. There's classes here that the people in my home come to. They partake in them. They don't have to pay for them. There's musicals that they come to. My home functions very well. I, like I said, I've been doing this 25 years, 16 years here in Portage County, four years in Outagame County. I love my job, I love the, love the people in my home, but it does take a village. I come here, also the GPS program. I have wanderers, people that would be lost. I came over here and brainstormed and they hooked me up, the ARDC, with the uh, Portage County uh, Police Department to help me to get GPSs for a couple of folks. So if um, they happen to wander off, you know, which that could happen, you know, you're in a crowded place, find them right away. But without the resource center, I would have never known about this. They helped me with that. I can't say enough about the ARDC and community care. We work together hand in hand. Without them, I don't think my program could run as well. I, it's not even a thing. I know I can't run my program the way it should be run. I will lose out on so much, so will the people in my home. The lady that lives there with me, that I want to continue living with, she will have to go. She's been there five years. And I don't want to see this happen. You know, I'll tell you, I turned 60 years old this year. And one of these days, I will be coming over here, sitting and trying. Hopefully, if we're still around, if the governor decides to not destroy our little community, our little village of people with this budget proposal. I would like to utilize these, I'm sure, because this is my home. I live in Hawaii. I love the people in this area and I want to continue to be here. I want to continue to keep my business running as good as it does with the help of the community. Thank you for listening to me. I, I pray and I hope that this budget doesn't go through, and I, I don't know what we're all going to do if it does. But thank you very much. I'd like to introduce you now to Mark Hilliker. He's the CEO of Community Care Connections of Wisconsin, our managed care organization that delivers family care in our region as we get to the third part of our press conference. Thank you very much, Patty. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Family Care Program in Wisconsin, and specifically about Community Care Connections of Wisconsin. Uh, but I think, um, as you probably noted already, the, the voices of the long-term care system are probably the most compelling part of the day to be here and listen to the way that people are affected by 
the system that's in place and the potential impacts that are out there for folks, I'm sure this budget proposal go through. The proposal that uh, Governor Walker included in his budget for this next biennium is probably the most significant public policy change in the history of the long-term care system. It's a big change, a sweeping change to the entire system. We're talking about today the ARCs, the Irish program, the family care, and as you've heard a number of people say already, this is a very integrated model. We all depend on each other um, to make the system work very well. Family care is a state program that provides Medicaid-funded managed long-term care services to over 40,000 people in the state of Wisconsin. The program is administered by eight regional managed care organizations and is operational in 57 of Wisconsin's 72 counties right now. There are currently seven counties in the northeast part of the state that are actually coming into the family care program as we speak. So you can imagine the challenge that they're facing with this budget proposal on the table. When that transition is completed in the northeast, there will only be eight counties left in the state of Wisconsin that don't have the family care and Irish programs. Those counties are largely to the north of us, Vilas, uh, Oneida, Forest, Florence County, Taylor County, Adams County to our south, and then Dane and Rock Counties uh, in the southern part of the state. The family care program was really started by Governor Tommy Thompson in the late 1990s. It was the result of four years of planning with a large group of stakeholders from across the state, from across the long-term care system. It was piloted in five counties, including Portage County, for eight years before it was expanded. So during that time, we were able to develop an approach to providing a successful managed long-term care program in the state. We were able to figure out just exactly how to run that program before it was expanded. What you'll notice about the, the proposal that's on the table is that there is no piloting, there is no planning that's taking place with stakeholders, uh, and there is only about an 18-month transition uh, for 50,000 people in the state of Wisconsin. I think that's a recipe for disaster. Community Care of Portage County was formed in 2000 as a pilot program for family care. In 2008 and 2009, the organization started to expand regionally. We added Marathon County and then Wood County, and then in 2011, Lincoln and Langley counties came into the program. And just this last January 1st of 2014, we added 11 counties in the northwest part of the state. We serve people from Stevens Point to Superior. Large, large geographic area. We work very closely with the ADRC of Portage County, and we work with five other ADRCs across our service region. As has been, has been mentioned a number of times, the ADRCs are the gateway to, the, to um, information and referral as well as to the long term care programs. So any enrollment in family care has to come through the Aging and Disability Resource Center, through that options counseling process, through uh, an opportunity to discuss what options are out there and if somebody is functionally and financially eligible to be a part of the long-term care program, they can choose to enroll them with family care or with IRIS. Our program, Community Care Connections of Wisconsin, supports 5,700 members on a daily basis across our 16 county region. We employ almost 430 people in 14 regional offices. We've, de we've developed over 1,400 contracts with service providers across nearly 40 service categories. We have a 2015 budget that's almost $225 million. So how many people here knew that Community Care Connections of Wisconsin employed more than 400 people or that we serve 16, 16 counties? It's a, a, a fact that a lot of people don't, don't really know about or haven't really heard. And I think it's important for us to, to understand how a locally grown, homegrown program has evolved and changed over the past 15 years. We're overseen by an 11-person board of directors and we're formed as a long-term care district. It's essentially a local unit of government. We're an industry leader in quality, member satisfaction, and program innovations, all things that we're really proud of. So what, what do these changes that are proposed in the budget really amount to? In essence, the changes that are proposed would dismantle our long-term care system in the state. It eliminates the hours program. It essentially eliminates the family care NCOs that are providing support across the state right now. And will have a huge impact on the aging disability resource centers. 
This proposal was drafted with no knowledge of long-term care system stakeholders, so those kinds of Department of Health Services who oversees the program. Governor Walker didn't discuss these sweeping changes as part of his budget address to the legislature, nor has he spoken of them since. As I mentioned, this specifically eliminates long-term care districts by the middle of 2017. And as, I, as I said, CCCW is a, a long-term care district. There are lots of unanswered questions about why this proposal was developed. I've talked to literally hundreds of Wisconsin residents about this proposal. Not one of those Wisconsin residents has been in favor of it. They ask a lot of questions. Why this proposal? Where did it come from? Why hasn't the governor spoken about it? What are we trying to fix? All legitimate questions as this proposal offers few de details and no information on potential costs or savings. Our current system is nationally recognized and respected. As I mentioned, it was developed over four years of planning and piloted in five counties for eight years. It was designed by people in Wisconsin to support Wisconsin's most vulnerable citizens. The system has met all of its key objectives as it was set up for it. Program started, we've enhanced access. When the program started, there were over 11,000 people on waiting lists in Wisconsin. In the counties that have family care, the 57 counties, there are no more waiting lists. So anybody who comes in who's eligible can enroll immediately. We've improved choice by building a broader provider network members to choose from. We've continued to improve quality over time, and we've proven to be cost effective. And that cost effectiveness has actually saved the state of Wisconsin hundreds of millions of dollars on an annual basis. It's a proven system and it works. Our current system is, is run by Wisconsin based organizations whose sole mission is to support adults with disabilities and frail elders. We live in the communities that we serve. We have a local presence, local accountability, local expertise and experience. We understand the different cultures, geographies, and preferences within our service regions. We know that one size doesn't fit all. We know that care in Milligore isn't the same as it is in Milwaukee. We support people in living meaningful lives as full citizens in their communities. Do the national insurers who, who would run the new system have the same values and the same missions? I don't believe they do. I believe they're more focused on market share, profit, motivations, and really trying to build return to their, their shareholders. The state has, has pointed us to a number of other states where there have been changes in their long-term care systems. One of them in particular, Kansas, uh, we took a look at. Over the first year and a half of the, the program implementation there, they lost close to $200 million. The same national insurers who would be interested in Wisconsin then asked for $40 million in performance incentives on top of those losses. What happens if they don't make enough money here in Wisconsin? What happens if they end contracts? There's no more system here. No more infrastructure if this proposal goes through. And I bet the responsibility will fall back to counties, and I don't think that the counties uh, would be strongly in favor of that since they don't have the infrastructure in place. So if these changes go through as proposed, CCCW and most likely all other existing MCOs would be forced out of business. If that happens, it's a potential loss of 3,200 jobs just in the last year. A loss of 550 jobs in IRIS. Loss of jobs at the ADRCs. Loss of jobs and businesses related to our provider networks. And most importantly, a significant impact on those served. Right now, we have a person-focused and community-centered model of managed care that's going to move to a medically-focused insurance-based model, and those are really big differences. I'll leave you with this to think about. Two scenarios. Imagine a place where who you are is known, honored, and valued. Imagine this place knows what makes you happy, what makes you feel important, what makes you feel stressed out, what your strengths are, where you would sell, where you need help, what doesn't make you feel very good, what makes you feel on top of the world. Imagine this place helps you live the life of your choosing because this place is equipped with the people who know you, respect you, and most importantly, honor the life you wish to lead. 
Now imagine a place where you are faceless, nameless, and perhaps only identified by a file reference or a number. What you are good at, what helps you be your best, where you like to go in your community, what has worked well for you in the past, how to avoid issues with carefully planned interventions for success, and what makes you laugh from the depths of your belly or unknown, forgotten, or overlooked. This life you wish to lead is no longer talked about, planned for, or honored. You were once a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, a joke teller, a daughter, but now you are simply a file number or a reference. The two scenarios that I just walked you through point out the differences between the system we have in place today and the proposal that is before the legislature. They are vastly different. The people of Wisconsin have united behind our current system. Their voices have been heard across the state. We continue to ask members of our Joint Committee on Finance to remove this significant public policy discussion from the state budget so that we can have a recent dis discussion and engagement about the future long-term care in the state. I urge you to keep spreading the message to keep our long-term care system local. At this point, I'd like to turn uh, the microphone over to Janice Ribbons. Janice is a family care member. She also happens to be the chairperson of the board of directors for community connections in Wisconsin. And Janice is going to talk about how self-direction through family care has enhanced her self-determination and supported opportunities to remain active in the community. So. Better, but they like to have 
they have their programs better, but it all works together and everybody gets the kind of support they need. I choose to stay with family here because, well, I like working with them. They're some great people and I've made great friends. But also I like that little bit of extra support that I get with having a nurse and a, and a social worker. It's a community resource specialist and a health and wellness support leader in the new terms um, help me out with things. Um, I've been through everything that Mark was talking about with the expansion of family care, seeing um, this opportunity for people to stay in their own homes longer and, and direct their own care as they choose to, or if they don't, it can be arranged there. The care managers help them um, with um, whatever it is that they need help with. But I've been able to see that expansion through the marathon and they get a bank laid it out in the Northwest. It's interesting. How the people in the Northwest were really afraid of this change, but they have been very, very happy with family care. And I, I don't know how close by five minutes. <laughs> okay, good. Well, if any of you have been doing any ad advocating lately, you know at the listening sessions with the legislators, we get two minutes, so we really had to cut this down before I went up. Um, I just want to say that I, I don't think I'd be who I am right now without the family care program and what has gone into it. Because with working with people and finding out that there's so many people in the community with the same issues, um, watching my mother go through being the main caregiver for my father and accessing the um, ADRCs, she was able to get help with counseling and also help with my dad. My sister, just had her sister in law's family go through being able to take their mother out of assisted living and bring her home for the last eight months of her, her life, and that was the help of the ADRCs. I call here on a regular basis to ask for that care list. If you remember back to when um, I can't remember any, I was first talking about the availability. They have a list here of um, pre-screened caregivers, and I call here and check with that when I need the caregivers. Um, so I just it's a really great group of organizations that work together to allow people like me. I live on my own now. I don't have to have somebody in my home 24 hours a day. I don't have to be around people, I don't want to be around. I have friends and family working for me. I have a really great quality of life that when I broke my neck at 17 in the car accident, they told me I'd be either in an institution or have to live with someone for the rest of my life. And I don't have to do that. So and I can come to opportunities like this and speak out and be part of my community and feel like a very valued member of my community. That's very important. Uh, I'm really grateful to these organizations and I sincerely hope that our legislators take some time to look at these and see how much it means to people. And if they want to do that buck falls here thing, look at the numbers and tell me why you're trying to fix a, 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 a group of organizations that have been working so well with such good quality reports, such good member satisfaction. Other states in the Union, uh, in the United States, Want. They, they call us up and they ask for us to speak. Um, don't, don't fix what isn't broken. Before retiring, Bob worked for two different Portage County banks with the assistance 
from an employment specialist that was funded through family care. Bob is the first to speak up if he feels his brother has been treated unfairly. He works to make sure that he can visit his brother and keeps pretty good tabs on what's going on in his brother's life. Mm -hmm. Okay. As we sit here, Bob tells me more and more than I can say. <laughs> Bob is quick to hand out compliments and to thank others around him. He has made many of us walk away smiling when he tells you how nice you look. He has volunteered for the Salvation Army as a bell ringer, wanting to make sure everyone in our community has what they need. Bob loves a cold beer and listening to the brewers and the packers, not the bears in the Carol. I can tell you that Bob doesn't, what he doesn't like is a casserole. His one regret is leaving his brother behind, this is where I'm cry, leaving his brother behind at Northern Colony. So why would I share that Bob doesn't like casserole? I share this because it's meaningful to Bob. Casseroles remind Bob of his own time spent in Northern Colony, when he didn't have the ability to make his own choices and control his own outcomes, before he was able to move home to Portage County. Bob is quick to tell you that Portage County is his home and that this is where he wants to be. He's been a member of CCPC and now CCW since it was first piloted in 2000. With supports from CCW, Bob has been able to make his own choices and decisions about where and who he lives with and what he does with his time. Bob's local support team is led by Bob. He's the first to tell you that he makes his own decisions and that he is his own guardian. And we've all heard that a million times, I want to tell <laughs> After living in different adult family homes in Stevens Point, Clover, and two minutes across the Portage County line, which was too far from home for Bob after he decided he had met his health outcome, Bob told his team that he wanted to live in his own apartment. Bob saw no reason why a blind, intellectually disabled, physically impaired, and sometimes called non-compliant, adult man couldn't do this. <laughs> a man who had once lived without choices was confident in his own ability to communicate his outcome, and he was confident that his team would listen and support him in making this, this happen. His team used local connections and supports to empower Bob to reach his outcome. Bob is now living in his apartment, and directing his days as he sees fit with support from his friends like Tana, Amy, Makira, and his family and CCW. Bob, like many of us, has unpaid supports that also assist him with staying connected to his community. He has friends to go out to eat with and make plans with. He has a brother to keep tabs on and a family to visit with. He has a church he belongs to and that reaches out to him when he's been gone too long. He knows that his team understands and appreciates the strengths and dynamics of his community because we live here too. Bob will tell everyone on his team not to make decisions without his input. It is his life and he will make decisions about his life, where he lives and who he spends his time with and who gets to provide services. Bob is here with me and gave me permission to share this story. I've known Bob for 20 years. I met Bob a long time ago when I was a waitress at Country Kitchen. <laughs> and our paths have crossed many, many times for lots of different reasons. In Bob's words, don't make decisions without me. I am my own person. CCW and Bob's Portage County community, all of us, Bob enjoys coming to the ADRC three days a week. He enjoys going out to the Olympic for a fish fry. I hear it's the best fish fry, that's what he tells me. And he has big plans to ride the zipper this summer. <laughs> you better be ready. <laughs> All right, so this Portage County community has, has provided the support and ability not only to maintain Bob's quality of life, but to improve it. He lives in his own apartment where he feels safe and supported, and most importantly, empowered to be his own person. Thank you. or to share their stories. I know I will stay for as long as it takes today. So thank you to all of our speakers, to each of you. 
each of you for your voices today. I'm grateful for your courage, for the way that you have answered the call today. As we said at the beginning of this press conference today, we are creating a video and we will have uh, instructions about how to tap that video at my government official Facebook page, Patty Dreyer government official page, or the county's website, I should say, and the county's website, uh, www.co.portage.wi.us. I'm just going to sit down as I had been before. So in closing then, today we've highlighted three key areas of service in a system created by the people, for the people, and supporting the wills of the people here in Wisconsin. They want to age in place in their homes to continue to be taxpayers as they're able to be engaged with their own families and communities. ADRC's Iris and Family Care were co-created. They work collaboratively and as one in tandem with each other, applying best practices and ensuring the best of quality of care and cost-effective local and regional service for Wisconsin elders and people with disabilities. And all of this, in turn, supports thriving communities where people want to go on the zipper in the summertime. <laughs> I'm not doing that, by the way. <laughs> and also, it, it's about employing local people to serve their neighbors face to face and with respect and understanding that comes from knowing each other well and sharing that same community. ADRC's Iris and Family Care help keep our families together and our communities vibrant as told through the voices and the stories of Lois and Mavis and Don and Leslie and Janice and Bob. ADRC's Iris and Family Care also keep our communities and local economies strong as described through the voices of Lois and Tana and Mark and Cindy. Thank you for listening. We want to make sure our state leadership also hears our message. The message is ADRC's Iris and Family Care, to quote my mom, they're keepers. Wisconsin has come a long way in 20 years of developing these models. Let's continue to work together to fine tune them and ensure that they're, along, they're around for generations to come in helping us serve our citizens, our communities, our local economies, neighbor to neighbor, years to come. Thank you everybody for being here today and making this possible. Anybody can um, address questions, and I know there are a few other folks that wanted to share a story. So uh, this becomes an open session for us now. Thank you. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs>